Welcome back to Reviews with Elaine, because I have opinions. And today's opinions will be about Goblin Secrets by William Alexander. So this is one of those books that I bought uh, because I was in a used bookstore and it's really hard for me to leave those without buying things. But also I was like, I could really use with a couple of real quick reads on my shelf for those times when I don't really want to jump into like a tome of a book. And this looks fine. And oh my god, this was so much better than fine. I loved this book. Uh, so Goblin Secrets is a middle grade book. It's about a young boy named Roni. Uh, that's not really his name. He sort of doesn't have a name. It's just his older brother, Rowan's name made small. Uh, Roni hasn't seen his brother in months ever since Rowan was arrested for performing on stage, which is illegal in their city of Zombie. Uh, Roni has been left in the tender care of Grabba, the witch worker on clockwork chicken legs who, or who lets orphans sleep in her downstairs of her shack in exchange for them running all of her errands. But when Roni sees a poster for a play performed by goblins, he decides he's going to risk the life he has now to see it. And that risk leads to a lot more risks. Uh, he takes the money that should be Grabba's to pay for his admission. He risks being stolen by goblins and changed into one of their own. And he risks his life itself by taking their invitation to step on stage and put on a mask. But he's happy to take all these risks if they bring him closer to his missing brother. Okay, so I don't even know where to start with this book because I just loved everything about it. I loved it. I loved the writing. I loved the story. I loved the characters. I wanted to live in this world. Like this should have taken me one night to read, but it didn't because I kept putting it down because I didn't want it to be over. I kept being like, I want to just sort of inhabit this world for a while and I was happy to like let the moments percolate in my brain and it was just so sweet and magical and specifically it was the kind of magical that I remember from when I was a kid when I didn't know how things worked and so I just made up logic in my mind and sometimes it was wildly not how things worked but it felt right. Like, for example, when I was little, uh, I assumed that water flowed through me when I was in the bathtub rather than flowing around me and being displaced by my mass. By the way, I don't know why I remember that, but I just have very clear memories of sitting in the bathtub and realizing that when I lay down, the water level rose, which meant that me and the water could not be taking up the same space. And I don't know why, it's a very clear formative memory of me realizing the world did not work the way I had assumed it had. Uh, but that was all one really long-winded way of saying that this book felt like the way the world felt when I was small, full of wonder and potential and scary things. But those scary things might turn out to be cool because I knew so little about them. And so everything was mercurial and changeable and just full of magic. I feel like a lot of this came from the prose. Uh, this book does an absolutely wonderful job of constantly coming up with the incredibly simple but intensely evocative language that I dream of being able to write. Like, a lot of this book is about how language and belief remake the world, and there are just so many beautiful moments when, for example, Roni put on a mask and felt like a giant and stood like a giant, and people knew he wasn't a giant, but at the same time they believed he was a giant, and it's stated sort of that simply, and yet it comes across so clear what it's talking about, and, uh, and it's one of those middle grade books that does the magic thing where it takes metaphors from our world and sort of makes them literal parts of the world building. Like masks don't just look like their characters, they have the innate soul of their character built up inside them and they almost possess their actors. And this is all things that like we sort of imagine as like non-literal in our world, like the way authors talk about their characters taking over the book. It's that sort of we're imagining it, but in this world, it is truth. And on a side note here, this book also really managed to capture the feeling of the magic of acting better than any book I've read, at least recently. I can't think of any others. And like, it's not all literally correct. Like, did the description of the play actually sound like a play that could be successfully performed as described? No, 
Absolutely not. You'd need a lot more actors, you'd probably need more than just a wagon. Like, there's a lot going on here that does not logically make sense. But did the way that Roni felt about being on stage feel like how acting felt at the best of times? Yes! And I'm a firm believer that, especially in books for kids, sometimes getting things emotively right is more important than getting them literally right. And this entire book, it, everything about it is emotively right, and, like, the feeling of emotively right permeates the entire world building, even stuff that does not literally make sense. And there was this idea that the coal in the world is actually hearts that are burned for power. Uh, there's thing, things like the dust fish, the clockwork mingled with magic, the curse-based magic system where just saying something with enough intent makes it real. The way acting can be dangerous because it speaks to every aspect of the city and speaks for every aspect of the city. The guards with their clockwork eyes who don't like Southside because it's not built in straight lines and they can't march quickly without straight lines. This all feels right in an intensely powerful way, and I can't really put my finger on what makes it feel so right. I can't explain to you necessarily the logical metaphors and what it's doing within the story, because it does it so well that it just feels background. You just feel it. You don't think it. And a brief pause on that note, uh, I do want to say yes when things are emotively right, there is a slightly higher chance of it not working as well for everyone. Like, I think this book is perfectly emotively right in all ways, but my emotions aren't the same as everyone else's, so I understand that this is one that other people might not love as deeply as I do, but I do feel like there's a lot that it hits here that should be pretty universal. And I love the fact that this emotive rightness carries through the entire story. There are so many elements that aren't literally explained. Though there's almost always answers between the lines if you're willing to stop and think about them. Uh, like, spoilers here, uh, it's pretty clear that Simile, the goblin, has a connection to Graba. And it's never directly stated what these connections are, uh, but there's enough mirrored storyline, there's enough little hints here and there, that you don't really need to literally know what happened because you can feel what happened. And I am personally 100% happy with this. I think it works beautifully within the story. Uh, there's also a running theme of things that little kids don't understand and have to just accept that they don't understand because no one will answer their questions or there are too many questions or not enough time to ask the questions. And so kids just sort of have to keep moving with the feeling that they might know what's going on but they don't really and there are no clear answers. And that is something that, yeah, felt really childlike to me, and it continues straight through the climax within the actual plot of the story. There's a moment when Roni just sort of knows what he has to do, and the book doesn't lay it out for us. Uh, Roni clearly isn't intellectually aware of why he is doing what he is doing, but he does it anyway because he basically can feel that that's what he's supposed to do. And yes, it's the sort of ending that felt perfectly right, but isn't literally logical. Like, the climax, it's one of those things that you're like, I'm going with it, it feels right, it feels right. If you stop to think about it, you're like, okay, there isn't, it doesn't really literally make sense, but it doesn't need to. That's part of what makes it feel magical. It also helps to add the feeling that this book has of being really settled into folklore. Like, there's a softness to the world building, and I don't mean that in a bad way, I mean a good way. We know pretty much nothing of what the world looks like outside of this city. We don't know what the government really looks like. We don't know uh, things about the religion. Uh, we know a bit about what level tech we're at, but not really that much. And a lot of things we think of as good world building just aren't in this book. But we don't need them because it's so littered with the tiny, evocative details that make it feel like it exists in a bigger world than it actually does. Uh, the stories that Rowan and Roni use to share of uh, pirates and abandoned barracks, the mysterious diggers, the madness of the gear workers, all of these little details are what make the world feel large and fully populated, even though what we actually see in the book is soft and small 
We have a very small cast. We have a very small world. And then we add in all the little nods to our real world folklore. Like uh, the Baba Yaga and Vasilisa references popped out at me immediately. But I suspect there's a lot more here that I just didn't quite pick up on. And there's a lot of nods to this sort of thing that just makes it all feel like folklore. It feels like a fairy tale, but with so much more life and depth and character than actual fairy tales get. And on that note, the city itself felt like it was so beautifully painted. Once again, it's a painting made of a few up-close details with very little big picture, and it's fine. It works beautifully within the book. Uh, there's just enough of these details to make it feel like the Emerald City mixed with Oliver Twist's London, and just a hint of Neverland thrown in there for funsies. And it just amazed me how creepy and sweet and playful this world felt. And this book made me cry, and not just a little. This was one of those stop and stare at the page with tears streaming down your face kind of crying. And, like, I did not expect that from a light middle grade book. And uh, if you're worried that it's too sad, a uh, small spoiler here, but I would call this ending happy, but slightly melancholy happy. Uh, uh, but... I do remember in one of my high school theater classes, uh, my teacher once told us that if you want your audience to feel for you, you shouldn't cry. You should try not to cry. And that will get people invested a lot quicker. And this book really shows that beautifully. Uh, there's a scene that spoilers, Roni is trying really hard not to have big emotions and to just do what needs to be done. And it hits so hard. But also, I mentioned that this book took me a lot longer than I thought it would. But also, once I was done with it, I couldn't sleep because I just kept laying there, thinking about the world, thinking about what might happen next to the characters, thinking about how I could make my own writing as simple and evocative as this is, thinking about how the hell to pronounce Roni. Because if there's one thing I did not like about this book, it's that it's the name. Conceptually, I love it. Like, it works. Saying it aloud, feels wrong. Every time it comes out of my mouth, I'm like, that. that's not right, that I'm doing this wrong. Uh, but name aside, there was just so much I loved about this book. Like, I don't usually do this, but I really want someone else to read this so I can discuss it with them. I have some theories about Roni being the city and being born of the river that I would really like someone else's feelings and input on. And so, yeah, if you've read this one, feel free to talk to me in the comments on this one. Uh, but other than that, I don't really have much to say other than just, I loved it. Like, I know why negative reviews tend to be more popular, tend to be longer, and tend to be more fun to watch. Uh, and it's because it's just easier to talk about what's wrong with a book than what's right. Partially because if you're really enjoying a book, chances are you aren't thinking about the craft of it, you are just in the world. You're having emotions along with them. Uh, you probably aren't thinking much at all. You're just absorbing the story. But also because it's pretty easy when you find something wrong with a book to try to imagine the ways to make it better, to imagine how to fix this, and how to use the advice that you got from that wrong thing for better books. But it's in the end, just a lot easier to talk about what's wrong with a book than what's right. And this book, I didn't really see anything wrong with it. Everything about it made me happy. And yes, there are questions I still have having finished it. I still crave more of this world, but in a way, I don't really want answers to the questions I have, because I feel like it would erase some of the magic. The mysteriousness, the softness, and the lack of literal explanation is part of what makes this book encompass that childlike, magical awe. And uh, I have found out there is a sequel, and yes, I want to order it immediately, but I can't because I need to not buy books right now. Uh, but also, it has a new main character, and I think that's perfect. I want more, but in many ways, I want this to remain feeling like a standalone. I don't want too many answers, and I'd be terrified that if we continued with these characters, we'd get too many answers. And I want the magic. I want it to remain magical. I don't want it explained. 
And yeah, overall, I think you should read this one. It definitely deserved the National Book Award that the sticker tells me it won. And this book was just absolutely beautiful.